Hello guys, I'm coming to you today from my back porch. Um, the rain's pretty much stopped, um, for now anyway, so I've spent the morning um, working some at school. It's definitely sad and quiet there without you guys. Uh, we're starting to miss you a lot. Um, a couple things before we start on our group time today. Um, just be aware that you will have more work packets ready for pickup on Monday. I'll get there by 8 in the morning, so um, just let your parents know whenever is a good time for them to come by. Um, please drop off your work you've worked on this week for me to check, and you'll have some new stuff to take home. Now hopefully after next week we will be given the go-ahead to come back to school, but nobody's really holding their breath right now we're still not sure um, how this is gonna pan out day to day so in the event that we do not get to come back to school um, the first week in April like we're all hoping um, make sure that you have logged on to your Microsoft Office um, when you first log in, it does take, it can take a few hours to set itself up. So when you first log in, if it says you have no documents or anything like that, wait a few hours, go back and check. And of course you are welcome to message me, text me, call me. Um, if you're having any problems, I'm still learning it too. So um, thank you, Mr. David. I'm definitely have been relying a lot on him to help me figure it out as well. Okay, but, um, we're going to be relying heavily on that as our main classroom if we are not able to go back to school um, after next week. So definitely make sure you can log on and get yourself familiar with that. All right, today we are going to talk a little bit about um, industry, the Industrial Revolution. So one of the first things that started to spark that after the Civil War the railroad industry really really started growing so we had our we had our trains we had our railroads um, before then and during the Civil War of course because we heard about the Union trying to blockade the Confederacy from getting their goods by rail and or any other way that they could um, but after the Civil War and with the Reconstruction, it really started to take off. After the war, there was a boom in construction of new railroad lines made possible in part by a burst of invention. So here we have um, different people who have come up with some new innovative ideas. We have some new inventions that are allowing this to take place. Rails of solid steel replaced flimsy ones made of wood capped by iron. High pressure engines made the most of steam power for climbing steep hills. The front wheels of locomotives were mounted on new swiveling supports that allowed trains to take sharp turns. In 1869, George Westinghouse, only 22 years old, made railroading much safer by inventing the air brake, which used a locomotive steam to stop the wheels on every car of the train. Around the same time, Elijah McCoy invented an automatic lubricator that allowed trains to run faster and stop less often. Eli Janney devised a way to connect and disconnect train cars easily and safely, saving much time and expense. And George Pullman developed sleeping and dining cars so comfortable that they became known as hotels on wheels. So not only are the trains getting safer and faster because of inventions, but they're also getting more comfortable. More people are wanting to travel by the trains. It's becoming kind of, um, a luxury to travel by train instead of, of course, um, the other slower methods that we've had. Across the United States, more and more trains moved more and more products. Cattle for beef, lumber for building homes, personal and business mail, clothing and other items from new mail order companies that sprang up in the 1880s. All of these were distributed by rail. 
From 1865 to 1900, the cost of shipping freight decreased, which helped keep down prices for other goods. So now that it's faster and easier to move products from one place to another, it's getting a little bit cheaper, so more people are able to order. Trains moved people as well. As the network of railroads extended west, so did the population. That means that more people can move westward. So those who were not super excited about packing up in the covered wagon and moving out west um, now are better able to travel or those who did move out west, uh, maybe their families can come, maybe they can come visit, maybe they wanna move out to be closer to them. Trains carried thousands of homesteaders to the Great Plains. These Western settlers used the transcontinental railroad system to sell their goods on the national market. So, there's our keyword. I'm gonna write it. Transcontinental railroad. Not my best handwriting. Transcontinental. Trans means across. Continental would be continent. So they are going, the railroad goes all the way across the continent. Our continent being, I hope you all said North America. Um, I've got a map here and if you're able to log on to your Microsoft Office, I will upload this map in the there we go. In the content. So the red lines are showing where the railroad is spanning. Willow. Come here. Come here. Come here. My dog's barking at the neighbors. Okay. So as we're getting our new inventions for our rail system, um, it's also causing a need to make more products. Hang on one second. So we saw that the railroad now, instead of being made of wood and iron, they're making out of steel. Um, they are using steam engines. They're using different things. And so those things need to be produced. And because we have so much more of it and they're trying to build all the way across our continent, they need a lot of it. So that means it's gonna make jobs. Somebody's gotta work in the factory to make it. This is my ferocious puppy, Willow. Hi. Hi. Okay. So, America's Industrial Revolution began in the smallest state. What is the smallest state? Rhode Island. Where the first successful water-powered cotton spinning factory went into operation in Pawtucket in the 1790s. Steam power followed in 1809 and traditional farming life was replaced by factory work. So that means you had an option. You didn't have to just be a farmer. Um, and of course there were other jobs too, but now you have the choice to go get a job and work in the factory making these items that are being invented and the supplies for it that the other factories need to create those supplies. Mills required large numbers of workers and European immigrants flocked to them. That means that people who are moving to America from countries in Europe um, are getting jobs there. That's where they're first going. You know, they've left everything they know, they've left their home, they've left probably a lot of their family. And so they're coming here with nothing or very little and so when they get here, it's important for them to find a job. Um, so those factories and those mills um, helped them be able to find a job and make money to support themselves and their family in their new life. 
Later, factories were run on the steam engine, an invention that also changed transportation, like we just talked about with the railroads. Steam locomotives moved massive amounts of goods quickly and over great distances. By 1869, a transcontinental railroad spanned the entire continent. So what year did I say? What year was the transcontinental railroad completed? 1869. The efficient railroad system plus advancement in oil production, steel making, mining, and manufacturing turned the United States into a major industrialized nation by the early 20th century. So that means by the early 1900s, we had a whole lot of factories and we were making a whole lot of things. So some good things about that is now we can start trading our own goods with people in other countries. And um, we can start buying goods that were made in our own country. So perhaps they'll be a little bit cheaper. Um, we'll be supporting each other instead of giving our money to um, people in other countries that have made them. But it wasn't all fun and games. Here we've got another map. This one, sorry my camera kind of is backwards from how it is in real life, so I'm having trouble getting it in the camera, but I'll send this one also on your um, content library on Microsoft Office for when you're able to get into that. Um, I've got a few fun facts for you before we close our group time. The first one, if you're in fourth or fifth grade, you remember the book that we read called Silk Umbrellas um, earlier this year, and it was about a family in Thailand and how, remember, the sister had to stop going to school to go work in the factory, and um, even though she was still a child. And at the um, in the 1800s, um, that was something that some families and some kids also in America had to do. Um, they were also sent to work. And I've got this picture here. Shows some, some boys at work. And it says, by the mid 1800s, factory owners were looking for cheap labor to keep up with production. So they hired children working 12 or more hours a day for little pay, children weren't protected until late in the century when some states started to pass laws to regulate child labor. So that basically means they could hire kids to do the job for cheap. Um, they didn't want to spend a lot of money to pay employees. They wanted to make a lot of money. And so by hiring kids and basically taking advantage of them, making them stay long hours, making them um, do as they're told, then they save money and the work gets done. Now that's not good for kids. Can you guys imagine if um, you didn't get to come to school and you had to go work 12 or more hours working in a factory, building cars or whatever you had to do? Um, and we're making barely any money. It's not a fun time. So that's why today um, you have to be, I think the average age is at least 15 before you can work. And even then you've got, there are laws about how many hours you're allowed to work each week. And um, you still would require, um, they would have to legally pay you a minimum wage, which is the smallest amount of money that you can be paid for one hour of your work. Um, a few captains of industry, we have Andrew Carnegie. He is known for working his way up from a cotton mill worker as a boy. Carnegie invested in oil and then became a tycoon in the steel industry and one of the most wealthy industrialists to this day. And the other one is John D. Rockefeller. He's known for being the founder of Standard Oil the most dominant oil company in the country. The company's practices led to anti-monopoly laws, but only after Rockefeller became one of the richest men in the world. Here we've got those guys. 
This chart um, on the other side is showing about people immigrating to the United States. So the red bars are showing how many people and on the left it is showing what city that they are immigrating to. Most of us, most of you guys, you have ancestors who immigrated very likely during this time. My ancestors, I know um, on my father's side, immigrated from Ireland and moved to Chicago, which was a major industrialized city at that point in time. Um, so talk to your family, talk to your grandparents, talk to your great grandparents, and um, find out where your family came from. Where, when did they come to the country? Um, where did they come from? And you might find out some interesting stories. You might find out they came before then, or maybe they came after. Um, the last thing we have is our timeline. We have a timeline of the industrial age of the 1800s, and this will be pretty much the end of our 1800s experience. We'll be moving into the 20th century, big business. And um, it's down there, I'll, there we go. Yep, there we go. So I'll put it also in your content library for you. So the last few fun facts. Um, in 1867, the U.S. purchased Alaska. Lower elementary friends, you know what country they purchased Alaska from. Say it out loud if you know it. I'm going to pretend like I can hear you. And we're all going to say Russia together. They purchased it for $7.2 million. It paid off with the Klondike gold strike in 1896, and there are still gold miners in the Klondike in Alaska today. You may have seen the show Gold Rush. Um, they're up in Alaska and in the Klondike, still mining for gold. Uh, before 1871, 45,000 miles of railroad track had been laid in the U.S. By 1878, Standard Oil controlled about 90%. It's almost all of U.S. oil refineries. So that's John D. Rockefeller. So he owned almost all of the oil refineries in our country. And we know that we need oil for a lot of things, one thing being gasoline. And what would we need gasoline for, I wonder? Hmm. Henry... Ford's first 1908 Model T cost $825 and could travel as fast as 45 miles an hour. 45 miles an hour is about how fast you're allowed to drive when you're driving through town. Between 1790 and 1840, 1,200 cotton factories popped up in the United States. After oil drilling started near Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859, U.S. crude oil production reached 12 barrels a day. By the late 1890s, it was 156 barrels a day. And the last fun fact, the U.S. Patent Act was passed in Philadelphia in 1790. By 1836, about 50 years later, um, Almost 10,000 patents had been issued in Washington, D.C., and by 1900, more than 640,000. A patent is what you get when you come up with a brand new invention and you want to sell it to make money. So if you come up with an invention, you file to get a patent, and if you're approved, that means that no one else is allowed to make your product without permission. Um, it belongs to you. Now if you create an invention and you go around and you tell everybody about it but you don't have a patent, anybody can make it. So a patent is a way to kind of protect your ideas and um, I lost my train of thought. But a way to protect your ideas and your inventions. Um, speaking of inventions, fourth graders you have in your packet for this week or for next week 
you've got um, a little bit of inventor research. So I want you all to try to do a little bit of research on your own this weekend and try to come up with somebody who maybe you don't really know so much about that's an inventor. Um, let's see if all five of you can hopefully choose somebody different. Um, think about maybe something that you're interested in and um, how that came to be because um, you're going to be doing a little bit of a research project on that for us next week. And if we're back in school, you will present to us and tell us about it. If we are not back in school, um, maybe you can make a video to share with us about your inventor and what you learned. Okay, guys, so that's all I have for now. I'm going to um, hopefully have you a new group time video for every day of next week. Um, we are going to finish up U.S. history, so we will talk about um, women's fight for, for rights in our country, and um, we'll be kind of slowly moving into Europe after that. So I hope you guys are getting lots of rest and staying healthy. Bye!